of a uh, quorum of members present in the chamber. We'll call this uh, meeting of the Liberation and, and Freedom Committee uh, to order. Uh, the f next item is public comment. Uh, is there any public comment for matters appearing on the agenda? And if there is, just please uh, raise your hand or step up. Uh, and everyone has three minutes. Please just state your name and address uh, for the record. And, and just please keep it to agenda items. So my name is Sandra Kelch, and I live at 802 Augusta Avenue in Wausau. So I came tonight just to speak again on homelessness in Wausau and some of the recent comments that were made by a city council person. <clears throat> I'm not going to repeat everything that I said last night, but I did want to reemphasize just the constitutional constitutionality of criminalizing homelessness. And when you look at the Eighth Amendment, the excessive fines that our unhoused get, the repeated fines, they build up, they build up, they have no way of paying for them, actually goes against the Eighth Amendment. Um, it's also cruel and unusual punishment. We see our unhoused being in jail for months on nonviolent, bail jumping type charges um, that they are not a threat to society and they are in jail for months because they cannot post bail. Um, and when you look at those who are getting arrested for public intoxication, and I do understand that sometimes the behavior does warrant them to be arrested. However, just being intoxicated in public um, goes against the Eighth Amendment as far as cruel and unusual punishment for the very fact that when you have somebody who's a chronic alcoholic that has led to homelessness, if they do not have alcohol, they actually can die. Detoxing on the streets is extremely dangerous, and many do not have the access to rehab and detox or they're just simply so traumatized that they're just not at the point that they're ready. When you look at PTSD, kind of the same thing. Um, some of the behaviors that come from PTSD, we have seen it, has um, warranted um, disorderly conduct charges, and basically you're arresting them for mental illness. Um, <laughs> one of the big talks right now is the public urination defecation. And we do, as uh, our task force, to see that as an issue. It's a health issue. We have been to the uh, stairwell in question, and it is a problem. And it's one that we want to find humane, proactive solutions to um, that do not involve arresting people. Um, the other four, uh, amendment that I was looking at was the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the sweeping of private property violates property rights. Going in and throwing people out of their tents, out of their sleeping bags, that is their residence. And to simply reside there and be thrown out is a violation. Um, and just simply that, by and large, Thank they you. have That's no voice. Thank you. three minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other uh, public comment? Uh, good evening. I'm Lou Larson. I live at 904 South 21st Place. I am also the alderman for District 10, and I guess I I'm interested to see how the commute how the this uh, committee is going to proceed with this, uh, and because I would like to see. Well, first of all, you know we need this. We need to address the homeless in this community, but we also need to. Um, hold our elected officials and our city employees accountable for any mis misleading the public and um, because it re reflects on us all. Uh, homelessness is something that we really, really need to address and I'm glad to be a part of the new Public Health and Safety Committee of this year and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, 
I'd, least, I'd just like to say I'm homeless. I work every day for Marathon County Parks and Recreation. I've gotten citations for sleeping by the gazebo and that. Not drunk, not anything, just getting my sleep to go to work the next day. Because being homeless, I can't get a rental place. The landlords won't help me. The uh, NC cat, they can't help. They try, but because of being homeless, and I work every day, Monday through Friday for Marathon County, but I can't get no help. People up there get discouraged because they get roasted out of the place they got to stay. They're not causing trouble or nothing else. They get a little bit forward, but then they get arrested and fined and put in jail. It, it stops all the forward progress, and nobody's really doing anything wrong. Some people do, don't get me wrong. They get arrested for being obnoxious, whatever, you know, and they deserve that. But the ones that aren't doing that don't deserve it. But they get treated the same. You know, and it's just, it's rough out there. I got the money to get an apartment and no landlord will approve it because I was homeless. And we need some help. We truly do. You know, I'm a recovering drug addict and alcoholic. I've been clean for a year. I still work. I still do my thing. But they need some help. And they need help, not a kick in the back while they're sleeping. Okay? S <laughs> sir. Thank you. Sir. Uh, May I ask what me, you... Pardon uh, me. We're not... Uh, unfortunately, we're not allowed uh, that type of Q&A interaction during this. It's part of uh, open meetings concerns. But thank you for your input, sir. Uh, you may have some time left. Was there anything additional? Um, like I said, they just... People need to focus on other than the bad. Because everybody's not bad. And they get treated really bad in this town by the police department, everybody else, you know. So, thank you. Thank you. Any additional uh, public comment? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kopicki, you have to use your microphone. I was just interested in knowing the gentleman's name. Oh, sir, could you state uh, your name and if there is an address for the record. My name is Douglas Martin, and I stay right now at the, at the warming center over here at the Church Methodist Church. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up, Ms. Kopitke. Uh, so we'll move on to uh, approval of minutes. Uh, item number three, uh, is there a motion? A uh, motion from Ms. Kopitke, second from Mr. Herr. Any, uh, Edits, suggestions, uh, revisions. And seeing none, all in favor to adopt, aye. 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 Any opposed? That uh, passes unanimously. Uh, moving on to uh, item number four, educational presentation. Uh, update on local refugee resettlement from personnel of Wausau's Multicultural Community Center uh, associated with ECDC. We have Mr. Van Nord. Uh, thank you for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you so much and thank you for your time today. I'm happy to be here representing our Refugee Resettlement Office. Uh, like you said, my name is Adam Van Nord and I'm the director of the Ethiopian Community Development Council, also known as ECDC, and our local business entity is the Multicultural Community Center. Uh, we opened our doors back in November. Officially, uh, we saw our first arrivals here from Afghanistan at the end of December, uh, specifically December 29th. So we have just about four months of experience now as a staff um, working with these populations, and uh, we're happy to share some of the things that we've learned and some of the statistics for the benefit of our community. And uh, I'd like to give some overview in context for the work that we do uh, and leave any remaining time for any uh, questions if that's if that's okay um, do we have a time limit Tom that we're looking for um, some ideal might be uh, if you could 
perhaps keep the presentation to about uh, 10 minutes sure. maximum, but then we have time for questions from the committee as well. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. So uh, ECDC is one of nine national volunteer organizations that's tasked with rendering services prescribed by the federal government in cooperation with a number of uh, state and federal entities. So our job is really to render core services for individuals who are coming through the refugee, the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. Uh, we don't have control per se uh, as to who arrives. Uh, we can we can choose to accept uh, individuals on the basis of our local capacity, um, but the larger, you know, macro forces at work that are causing forced displacement um, around the world uh, is what kind of serves as the basis for people coming through the program and then into the United States where they're ultimately divided up uh, and sent to uh, local resettlement agencies such as our own. We see people coming to Wausau right now through um, either a tie to a family member or uh, just through assignment. And most of our Afghans that have arrived here beginning in January, uh, as you know, there, there are no there isn't really a substantial presence of Afghans in the area, so they fit that latter category as, as being assigned. Um, now that we uh, are starting to see other countries come through the pipeline, uh, from Somalia, Congo, um, we have individuals coming from uh, Senegal in the future, um, we are seeing more of those U.S. Thai cases where there's a local contact uh, in the community or in another uh, community in central Wisconsin and we just facilitate them being able to reunite with with that uh, with those family members um, we have resettled to date 71 Afghans uh, through the operation allies welcome which was an initiative that our US government um, put forth to get as many people out of Afghanistan following the fall of the Taliban back in August and most of the people that came through uh, have a substantial record of aiding or coming alongside U.S. Uh, special forces, allies, or um, State Department uh, programs, such as the U.S. Embassy in Kabul. Um, they tend to be educated, uh, most of them, or they would have been uh, in different military capacities, such as medics or infantry. Um, we even have a commander here in Wausau to date. So. Uh, it's a, been a privilege to kind of see them connect with our community and begin the process of integrating. Uh, we're happy to report that all of our households now have at least one family member who've gained employment. Uh, they're, they're finding jobs. Uh, the agencies in Wausau, such as W2 and FSET, who work on employment, have been very involved. Uh, we have the school district on board. Uh, we've been working closely with Mayor, Mayor Katie and her staff with the WASA PD. So we're just really happy so far with, uh, with the interagency collaboration that uh, we've seen to really be successful. Um, by all qualitative measures, our families themselves feel that this community is a welcoming community so far. And we owe that largely to the success of our community co-sponsorship program, which is uh, a model that we're using to connect groups of local volunteers and match them with these incoming families to provide you know, a number of supportive services, uh, as well as just a friendly face to say hello when they arrive at the airport. And so again, we're really happy with uh, what that says about Wausau and the, you know, the initiative of just seeing WASA embrace uh, different cultures, different backgrounds. Um, moving forward, we know some, some of the gaps that still exist are related to transportation. Uh, as many of you know, our local bus system uh, is limited in terms of how it can bridge and connect with different centers of employment, uh, such as our industrial park out on 72nd or some of the manufacturers down in Schofield. Um, and so for now, we're, we're relying heavily on employers to determine how they're going to accommodate uh, these new arrivals. And so we've seen some uh, innovative and, and potentially costly uh, ways of them providing transportation. Um, but we're looking to uh, people in the city and other stakeholders to continue 
thinking about how we can solve this problem, not just for refugees, uh, but for other community members as well. Um, so if you have any connections or, or things to follow up on that front, I'd be happy to exchange contacts uh, after this call. Um, I'll just say, well, I'll just wrap up by saying that refugees um, are a very a distinct class of immigrants. There's often a lot of confusion sometimes with uh, things that are happening at our southern border, uh, you know, with illegal entry, uh, undocumented, and, and refugees. And it's important to point out that refugees are one of the most vetted uh, immigrant groups that exists. Uh, they work, they go through an extensive process typically uh, that takes up to two to three years sometimes before they even arrive on American soil. Um, and that includes extensive background checks, verification of kind of uh, what prompted or what um, caused their, their situation, why they cannot be repatriated. Uh, it includes health screening. Um, really a wide range of, of partners are involved in that process before they reach uh, WASA. So it's important just to point that out. We also see uh, another form of immigrant called asylum seekers who would be coming to the U.S. on a much more um, expedited, uh, through a much more expedited process. And that tends to happen when there's sudden abrupt uh, eruptions or, or, or conflicts where people are, you know, forced to flee their homes. Uh, the Afghans themselves came through what's called a special legislative uh, power uh, known as humanitarian parole, somewhat similar to asylum, but even more expedited. Um, so most of the Afghans that are here in Wausau will be looking at adjusting their legal permanent status through the asylum process or through another channel known as special immigrant uh, visa application. Uh, but we do expect that in the next uh, 9 to 16 months or so, uh, all of them will have completed that process and have obtained uh, long-term legal permanent status. I will stop there for any questions because I'm really interested to know uh, what uh, comments our public might have or anybody here on the panel. Thank you for that info and update, Mr. Herr. Thank you for your sharing. Uh, I do have a question. Out of all those Afghan, uh, Afghani uh, refugees, how many of them are uh, kids, child, and how are they doing in the school systems right now? Great question. Thank you for that. We had 71 arrivals, and I believe the 36 of them were minors, so anywhere under 18. Uh, we still have a roughly 23 or 24 uh, in uh, elementary and middle school. Um, a number of them at the, the high school. And we've been working closely with uh, Chris Nyman, who has been the Director of Pupil Services in the Wausau School District. Uh, and he regularly uh, you know, provides feedback that the children are all doing really well. Um, they're integrating well. The language, you know, if they came with, with limited or, or low English proficiency, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're learning very quickly. And we really haven't had any uh, reports of uh, any incidents or issues. Um, I'm sure that they have struggles, right, that aren't uh, maybe being verbalized. And so we're trying our best to pay attention to, you know, ways that we can support them that they may not uh, be explicitly asking for. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Kopitke? Hi. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I have another question about the people that are here. I'm interested in knowing if there's anything that the women in particular need as they begin to navigate. Um, and I, I'm assuming that in, in this situation, most of them are men that are employed and the women are at home, or am I incorrect in that? That's correct. Culturally, especially with, mm -hmm. with this first group, uh, women are used to being more in the domestic sphere. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just say that uh, now that they're here, they are in a different society with different cultural norms, and we've already had many of them indicating a desire to enter the workplace. So, so that's one of my questions is what resources do you feel like the women need that would be unique to them? Um, I know that the men probably had some English in terms of their work with the United States military, but if the women are not and the children are getting some English at school, there, there seems to be a gap there for the moms, per se, and I wondered what, what you would be looking for to help them. 
Yeah, well, thank you for that concern as well. It is true. Um, uh, about 65% of our adult men do, do speak English, uh, at least good, you know, on a basic level. Um, some do not, but pretty much, uh, let's see, one, one of our women speaks English, and the rest have very little to none. So you are accurate. Um, that that is one of their barriers. Uh, however, all of our women are enrolled in English classes. Uh, we offer uh, pre-literacy English, so for, for those who can't even read and write in their own language, um, let alone English, they have uh, special tutoring set up through our uh, program. And then anyone who is you know, at least proficient with the English alphabet and phonetics uh, are entered into uh, programs at North Central Technical College. So that's been one way uh, to answer your question, that they're finding, um, you know, social opportunity amongst themselves, but also with other community members, because the classes at NTC are not just for refugees; they're open to the public in general. Uh, many of our women have become comfortable with our bus system, so uh, while there are a couple couple that are still hesitant or nervous about being alone out in the community without their husband, uh, many have began to you know, feel the freedom to explore and um, seek different social connections. We also work with New Beginnings for Refugees. Uh, they're a local community-based effort to provide awareness, um, social support, and just kind of fill in any of those gaps that we, that we observe along the way. And so they are taking a lead role in sponsoring events to get women connecting with one another, but also, again, with, with our community at large. So I think you know, again, the more that we can provide those opportunities and create safe places for them to, you know, begin exploring the community, the, the better they're going to be at uh, kind of branching out and not being uh, isolated in the home. Did that answer your question? It does. So I would just ask if you have anything that comes up, if you would just let us know so that we can have more information. Because as time goes on, in my experience, I have found that that gap can widen mm -hmm. where they rely on the children then to be their English speaking uh, representatives and then oftentimes the women get lost in the information gathering. So if something would come up, let us know and then we'll see what how we can help you. We will definitely do that. Thank you so much. Other uh, questions from the committee? Yes, Mr. Norfleet oh, and Ms. Campbell next. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Adam. Nice to see you. Good to see you again. Thank you for presenting. Um, do you um, have any ideas how possibly we could partner with you um, or anything that you anticipate that they might need that we might be able to assist with? Speaking in terms of this committee here, yeah. Yes. Um, I think partnership on a public you know, awareness level is important. I'm sure you know this. This committee is is experienced and has uh, connections with with groups that parallel your you know your mission and what you're about. So we have coming up on June 20th. I think it's a Monday. Uh, is World Refugee Day, and so we're hoping to coordinate some events and community engagement activities here in Wausau. Maybe a combination of outdoor and indoor storytelling. Uh, so we can s certainly keep you all apprised to that as we kind of uh, nail those events down. But if there are other things that dovetail with diversity uh, measures that, that we should be aware of, we are always looking for ways to partner and connect our families directly with opportunities to share their story. That would be amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Norfleet. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. So. Because of what this group is about, I wonder would it be, because we've spoke of as a group holding uh, events, and we have an issue with silos in this community, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I often get concerned that although kids are being assimilated into school, but are they being assimilated into a certain version of school, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And what's their ability to actually even meet black kids mm -hmm. or Hmong kids mm -hmm. or people from other backgrounds? And my other concern is, is to uh, the effect to let community know or what, what is our information 
when it comes to this push and pull mentality when it comes to assimilation mm -hmm. and our desire to see others operate the way we do opposed to them operating at their own pace mm -hmm. to what they want to grow i do you know get this uh you get new people and you get a thirst to want to help and uh I just want to make sure that a part of what our mission is is more of a reciprocal relationship. Yeah. You know, what can we give you and what can you give to the community? Mm -hmm. And that's not so much how much can I change you to fit into my mold to make me feel comfortable, but how can we create comfort levels amongst ourselves? Mm -hmm. You know, because sometimes I think we get caught up in too many different subject matters and don't realize they all interact you know if i'm a homeless person i could almost feel like the city don't care about me as much as a refugee mm -hmm. and that's not really true but are we really conscious of these things right because i can't help but to see him behind you so i do want i do want to make sure that you know i, I would like this to be a uh, a platform of uh, a lot of communication and a lot of interaction firsthand opposed to having a lot of people in a way you're correct having a lot of people translating and speaking for us all the time and I think that's what we were heavy into mm -hmm. because you know no two dogs or two birds think alike mm -hmm. so I would think that would go for uh, whether you Afghanistan or Hmong, yeah. each individual at the end of the day is an individual. Absolutely. And that's the core human reality we're trying to get to and, you know, try to wrap some policies around that mentality. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, and I can definitely appreciate what you're saying. You know, when we use the word integration, in, and we use it a lot, uh, what, we're, what we intend to say is that they're finding vital connections in this community. It, we don't mean that they're going to find all the things here that they would have had in their country of origin. It's not possible. But if we can at least help them find a semblance of what's, what would be home to them, that's our, that's our, our heart's desire. Um, and then, of course, you know, jobs and employment is all the nuts and bolts that we all have to deal with as, as humans. Um, and then secondly, to your point, it was with a heavy heart that I followed our previous comments about homelessness. And I do realize that, you know, there, there is a lack of equity in terms of what we give attention to. And I think that we all have got to do our part and be passionate about what, what we do and do it well. And that's what we intend to do. And I hope that things that were, were you know, utilizing the model of co-sponsorship, for example, why, why couldn't that be a model for homelessness? Why couldn't that be a model for some of these other groups that also need uh, community members to lend a helping hand? So I appreciate you pointing that out. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Grell. Yeah, just quickly. Um, I think uh, overcoming differences is one of the, another goal that we have in this group. And that also, I think, follows a little what Mr. Norfleet was speaking about representing these people in groups as individuals and allowing them to tell their story mm. and their experiences. And that basic level of connection with people can go a long way, I think, in overcoming a lot of these misrepresentations, vilifications, dehumanization of people, from homeless people to Afghans to you know, our own people in the United States, our veterans mm -hmm. who have served this country and are in need of great services as well, so. Absolutely. Yeah, well said. Is there, is, there any, uh, is there any effort or thought in that along those lines to have people tell their story? There has been, and okay. qu coincidentally, we had a great meeting with WHIPS uh, in, here in Wausau, and they're intending to come alongside of us to create another uh, four-part series uh, where refugees and immigrants at large can can get those stories out it's very important to us thank you yeah thank and, you uh, yes thank you for taking the time to be here today and giving this update to the committee really appreciate it you're very welcome thank you all thank you uh thanks and,
we have uh, item number five, uh, uh, another opportunity for an educational uh, presentation. Mr. Robinson, overview of Wausau Policing Task Force work and findings to date from Task Force Chairman uh, John Robinson. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today to um, present. Our, we're still in a draft stage relative to our recommendations. We um, are having a public community public hearing on the 18th of May, and we are encouraging people to review and comment on that, and then we will finalize the report and recommendations and develop an action plan that will be presented to the appropriate uh, city committees and, and, community, uh, uh, and the community. So I'm hoping that this will work. Oops. We got to get this set up. First of all, I'd like to just start out by acknowledging that uh, we were charged with, with reviewing a number of tasks by the city council. We'll get into those a little bit later. Um, but it put, uh, including the hiring, um, disciplinary processes, uh, what goes into recruiting, uh, educating, training the officers. Um, and we, we had a, a series of meetings beginning in September of, of 2000 through um, uh, last month uh, where we, we looked at various aspects of it. But I, I would like to acknowledge the contributions of the uh, police department and the community um, in, in helping us in our deliberations. We found that the department was very open to our request for information and we basically put the police department under the mi microscope and asked them to um, you know, share their information with us. And, um, they were, um, I think many in the department felt threatened by this uh, process, but they were very supportive of it at the, at the end of the day. And we just like to acknowledge that. We did spend a lot of time looking at other reports. We looked at the President Obama's uh, task force on uh, policing in the 21st century, which identified six pillars of uh, effective policing and re number of recommendations. We looked at the Wisconsin Professional Police Association's blueprint for change and had Jim Palmer. Uh, present to our committee. Um, we looked at the speaker's task force on racial disparities, recommendations to the legislature. Um, and in many cases, the department is already doing many of the things that are outlined in those reports, including the use of body cams, working, integrating mental health services and, and others. And, and the department's been a leader uh, in terms of police departments and trying to address the issues of, of homelessness. We encouraged our members to do ride-alongs with the officers to get a feel of what they go through. And I will share that, you know, in, in both of my ride-alongs within the first half hour, we were dealing mental, with mental health or behavioral health issues um, that, that are facing them on a, on a daily basis. And so we have high expectations for them. But we were impressed with the uh, professionalism of the uh, department and how they, uh, how they deal with issues. And we'll see if we can make this work. It's, oh, I apologize for that, but I'm gonna, Skip over a, a few things, but in terms of background, why were we, why were we appointed? Well, in uh, arising out of the George Floyd situation, there was a lot of concerns about policing in America. Uh, there were some local concerns that were raised. Uh, there were a large number of participants in in a march. Uh, subsequent to that, the uh, the head of the Wasa Police and Fire Commission requested that a task force be appointed, which the council agreed to in August of 2020, and uh, we began meeting. Um, again um, in September of that year. I apologize for trying to control a screen up there. Um, we looked at a number of things, including the, the who's involved in oversight. Currently, we have the Police and Fire Commission, five members appointed by the mayor, confirmed by the council, that uh, deal with it pursuant to the state statutes. We have the Public Safe, Health and Safety Committee, of uh, which um, Alder Larson is a member, as well as others, that looks at the policies and the mayor who has day-to-day -day responsibilities relative to the management of them. We set out to really look at the policies. And again, I apologize for this. But uh, the task force members were uh, myself, Pat Peckham, a member of the city council, Michael Loy and Will Harris, uh, representatives from the Police and Fire Commission and community members, Kayleen Colley, um, uh, Sarah Schneck and uh, Michael Kemp North, all of them bringing different perspectives and expertise and, and uh, uh, sharing that with us and developing our recommendations. But we had a number of task force meetings over them, 23 to date, uh, in addition to a number of listening sessions where we 
we drill down into what are the policies, how do they, you know, how do they track use of force, how many officer-involved shootings. We're fortunate that there weren't many to look at, uh, but they do a, a very good job of tracking and accounting and, and counseling and, and investigating. Uh, we went through those processes. We went through the hiring processes, uh, how they, you know, what, what qualities they look for, how they train them, and how they uh, build upon that initial training. We, we spent time again looking and listening to, reviewing and listening to people with, with outside recommendations. We, uh, we invited the, the staff from Marathon County, the DA's office and the, the sheriff's office to make presentations. We had uh, representatives from the, the North Central Healthcare presenting and, and how they integrate services. We talked about school liaison officers and, and other, other programs in order to build our knowledge and our understanding of, of them. Um, one of the things we were, we had a number of tasks, there were 13 tasks, including looking at whether there was systemic racism in the, in the department, looking at the policies and procedures, uh, developing recommendations, engaging the public and, and others. We took the uh, community engagement process very seriously and uh, the reference was made to the use of the Wisconsin Institute of Public Policy and Service. At, um, I'm going to always call it UWMC as a proud alumni of there, but at UWSP. Stevens Point, UW Stevens Point Wassa, that's so hard to say um, for me, but uh, none, nonetheless, uh, we engaged them and they were, uh, they uh, worked with us and we spent a lot of time, how do we get the feedback from the community? So we started out with seven listening sessions. Many of them were virtual, but we did offer in-person listening sessions to get a flavor of what the public's perception was on policing. Um, and we encouraged them to come forth. We had, you know, it was during the midst of COVID um, and, you know, it was a challenge to get public participation, but we heard um, some things that, that were worthy of uh, additional investigation. So we looked at those and we developed a community survey and that community survey was sent out to 5,000 plus, or approximately 5,000 homes in addition to be, it was made available online and I apologize again, um, uh, but we wanted to know something about them from a demographic perspective so we could look at it, um, what their, um, what the perceptions were of the uh, police department's operations, whether or not they interacted with it, any concerns that they had, um, in, in others. And we, we, we wanted to find out where do they get their information to make their decisions relative to policing. Um, and we, we had some interesting results in that the traditional ways of communicating, the, you know, you get it from the Wasa Daily Herald, uh, the newspaper or the TV, that, that's not necessarily true. There's a variety of sources, social media, friends and, and others, and, and we'll incorporate that discussion into some of our recommendations. Um, then we had focus groups. So we, we used the listening sessions to frame the survey. The, the survey, we, we collected some demographic information. We noticed that there were differences of, in responses relative to younger people with mental health issues with that had experiences with law enforcement, uh, LBGTQ community and in and, and other minorities. And we wanted to we wanted to drill down a little bit more and to find out what, you know, what is the difference in in those uh, opinions. So we set up five community focus groups and two within the police department because we wanted to make sure that we we captured the thoughts of the, the police officers as well. And and we found that there that while there were differences in response, there were still favorable f reactions relative to the, to the department's operations. It was just a magnitude lower, um, and, and there was generally very strong support for, uh, for the department um, in, in those sessions. So what are, you know, some of the findings were that uh, uh, we didn't find systemic racism, and part of it is there's, there's not, not clear data out there, and I think we'll get into some of our, you know, into that in some of our recommendations. But we we found that the majority of the respondents are satisfied with the Wassa Police Department's performance, 86 um, percent. Uh, but again, the young, non-white, um, heterosexual, non-heterosexual, and others did have that difference of opinion, again, to a degree, uh, but still favorable. People felt. They, we asked them a question, do you feel as safe as you did a year ago, and it was 50-50 split. Um, mental health and addiction resources were top priority of the citizens, and they, they were, they had flagged that. Um, that uh, recruiting quality candidates for the police department is critical, and that the community, um, 
gets their information from, from different sources, and we need to be cognizant of that in, in terms of, of how we communicate with them. But they re, the majority of the residents rated their interactions with the police department very favorably. So we made a number of, of recommendations, and they were broken down into four general categories. Mental health and human services, and I'll get into them. Uh, officer wellness, cultural competency, and community engagement. Um, in terms of um, mental health services, We want we Marathon, or Marathon County and the city currently in, work with North Central Healthcare in establishing the um, crisis assessment response team, where is a where a mental health worker goes out with law enforcement to respond to mental health um, emergencies. The problem with that current the current services is, is they're eight to five, Monday through Friday, and it's not necessarily when those events occurred. So our recommendation is to extend that into the evenings and into the weekends. We think that's a critical need to balance that, um, that support and have those, those people avail available. We felt that continued homeless outreach services by the police department is important. Uh, Officer Lemeron has, has done a very good job of, of inter, um, acting with the department, uh, although he's been pulled off of that. We think that that responsibility be, should be shifted from a sworn officer to a social worker that can work with them and identify some of those needs and, and work with them through them. We think it is critical that we work with North Central Healthcare uh, to develop community-based case management services. Many of the people that are homeless, many of the people with mental health issues, with behavioral and substance abuse issues, go through a revolving door. They get arrested, they go to the jail, they go or they get referred for crisis services, and there's no follow-up. There's nobody necessarily looking at, are they getting the medications, are they making their appointments? We think that, that community-based case management services are critical. Uh, there was a study that was done a few years ago looking at, at the people that present at the crisis center at North Central and the people that present themselves regularly at the jail, and there was a significant amount of overlap. And we need to address that as a community and provide the services necessary. We also think that there's a need for the state legislature to address Chapter 5115 of the statutes that deals with the issues of commitment in law enforcement's role in it. Um, many times officers um, take someone into custody, take them, transport them to North Central Health Care for crisis services, and they wait and they wait and they wait for a medical determination and other determination. We need to clarify what the roles and responsibilities are. If there's not a need for law enforcement, we need to make sure that the appropriate people are there. Some of that is statutory. Uh, there are some statutory impediments, and we think the legislature needs to step up and try to deal with that. We also, earlier we talked, there was a reference to Metro Ride and, and transportation services. There needs to be services for the, the homeless. We, we heard that loud and clear. You know, the, 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 there isn't transportation to the industrial park. There are a number of uh, areas that are missing, missing service. I and mean, it's important that we try to develop those services that, that are reflective of the needs of the community. So um, we would hope that the Metro um, group look at, at uh, where those services and how they can be enhanced. In terms of, of officer well, uh, officer wellness and training. Officers are under a significant amount of, of uh, pressure, and they they deal with trauma on a daily basis with homicides, domestic abuse situations, rape. Uh, you, you know, it's got to be. You know, I, I'm friends with several of them, and my brother-in-law is an officer. It's very traumatic. We need to make sure that we provide the quality um, health care, mental health services to those officers so that they can address those situations. And uh, we need to make sure that that service is provided by a quali qualified, trained professional that understands the trauma that they're going through as well as it should be available free of charge without co-payments and deductibles to the, to the department. We think that there's a need for annual uh, cultural awareness education for the officers. Given the fact that we are a changing community um, and there are cultural differences, we heard that loud and clear in, in how we uh, react and how different cultures expect law enforcement to be. There needs to be that training and we need to make sure that we expand and invest in mental health training resources for the department. 
in terms of cultural competencies. Uh, there are currently uh, interpretive services that are available. Those need to be expanded and, and proactively uh, marketed to the public so that they know that they're available, so that when we have that interaction that language isn't a barrier that leads to an escalation of the situation. And there's also, we're making a recommendation that they, that officers be trained and learn certain basic uh, phrases in the various languages of the community that we're uh, address, you know, working with. So, community engagement. WASA currently has a neighbor to neighbor program where they sit down in a, in a neighborhood setting and they provide updates. We think that that concept is good, but there's a need for ongoing dialogue within various groups, including the black, Hispanic, Hmong, LBGTQ uh, community and refugees and in other groups to establish a relationship and develop an understanding. There are cultural differences in the Hmong community. Um, they, they deal with uh, domestic abuse differently uh, and relying on the clan leaders. I think there's a need for them to understand what the underlying laws are and that we, we, are, we must enforce those laws, but to have that understanding of the cultural differences and have that dialogue so there's a, a, a better exchange of information. Uh, we think that there's a need to develop multicultural, multimedia communication policies, get the word out there, uh, not to rely just on Facebook, not to rely on a single source, but to, to be aggressive in, in trying to engage the public both, both ways, receiving and giving information. We need to make sure that there's a continued partnership with research organizations to collect information on social justice issues in the criminal justice system. Uh, we, you know, we have a snapshot of today. Uh, we need to make sure that we're, we're staying on top of the information and uh, uh, looking at that um, as it presents itself. Uh, we need to conduct a public service campaign about interacting with law enforcement to achieve positive outcomes. You know, there are high expectations relative to law enforcement. I think there's also roles and responsibilities for citizens, and they need to know uh, what those expectations are and how they should interact with law enforcement and, and to do that in a proactive manner. We also, th you know, finally we support a regular and periodic uh, community survey. Again, the survey was a snapshot in time, was very favorable, but we need to measure whether there are shifts or changes or or concerns going on in the community and, and be able to react uh, to those. The priorities are, you know, just the, the, the priorities were basically the, the mental health or the mental health services, the homelessness, the case management, um, those services that will help interface with. And again, you know, in my ride alongs, it, be, it became very obvious that, that Police officers are social workers and mental health workers. Um, for, you know, and they're asked to inter, you know, engage people on a, on a regular basis, and we need to make sure that we provide the training and the support resources necessary for them to do the job and to look at whether or not there is somebody else that should be responding to some of those situations uh, to make sure that we've got the, uh, the, the people in, in place. Um, we uh, then spent some time understanding that these aren't just city issues. We looked at dependencies, uh, you know, where, where, who else is involved in each of those areas. Uh, should it be the, the city, the Police and Fire Commission, North Central Healthcare, Marathon County, the state of Wisconsin, and the public? And we're, we went through each of those recommendations and identified who some of the partners are in those efforts and, and where we will need to engage them. So we're basically at the, the end of our process. It's been a good learning experience for me. My appreciation for the police department has uh, uh, grown as a result of it. I think that we see that we've got quality within the department, um, very good leadership and professionalism that, that uh, goes through the organization. When, you look, when we started looking at those pillars under the President Commission's report, we started looking at it was blueprint for change. Many of those recommendations were already in place, that they're tracking their, their, their officer-involved shootings, their officer-involved incidents. Um, they, they're investigating them independently. There are, they've been using body cams. They've been providing the mental health support services. They've been a leader relative to the homeless. Um, you know, so not to say there isn't room for improvement. They're, they're, um, they're ahead of many and most departments, uh, not only in the state, but probably in the nation in terms of trying to address them. So again, we will be taking the recommendations of the public on May 18th. 
we will be then you know looking at the, the public comment and the feedback that we received and developing our final recommendations and then a plan of action that we'll present to the City Council and Police and Fire Commission. So thank you uh, for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Robinson. Questions from the committee? Thanks, John. I just have a quick question. Um, you mentioned the final report is going to be an action plan for several different groups, and including the city. And I just wanted to dovetail back to the transportation services for the homeless. Did you come across anything in your um, meetings that you found to be solutions that we could begin to look at, or are those things that we um, could further investigate? Because I think that's a, a real concern. We didn't, we, but we didn't probe each of the issues for solutions. We were trying to identify needs and we were flagging them. I will tell you that independent of this, there's a, a, an evaluation taking place right now of the, the, the metropolitan, you're developing a plan for the, the tra transit. And I know that uh, Will Harris, who was a member of our group, is a, is a member of that um, oversight committee as well as I am. Um, one of the things that they're looking at is microtransit and, and how microtransit can fit in with the bus system and whether or not we need to rethink how we deliver services um, in, in the area that we serve. Uh, so that is being evaluated, but ultimately it's, it's a, an option that others will need to look at. Thank you so much. Mr. Grell. Yeah, thanks for all your work, John. Um, I see, seem to see you everywhere talking about something or another. But anyway, my dad was the first one to tell me to understand, uh, to be able to improve a, from a problem, you have to understand it first. And uh, my question is, uh, and I noticed that on number one, one of the, your number one finding was that there was no systemic racism found within the actions of the police force. But yet, um, you were going to come back and explain a little what that meant. Uh, I've, I'm a little leery of that comment. Uh, and it's also based on, it was less than a year ago, I was sitting in this room and a gentleman from DPW got up and he made the comment that there was no, uh, no in his entire uh, career uh, working as an environmental engineer, he has not noticed any type of uh, environmental racism, which really blew my mind. And I think to understand, I mean, to improve a problem, we have to understand it. And did we look at arrests by race, by income? Do we look at the rate, the type of arrests? You know, the, the low, the, the uh, less serious arrests, are those more for people of color or, or poor people? Um, so I just want to know, what did you look at to come to that? Because I think that's a very, it's, it's just kind of mind-blowing to me to accept that. Well, we, we, we did look at arrest data, we, and we looked at other things in there. And part of the problem is that, there's a, is that we're looking at the police department, which is part of a criminal justice system. And I think there are some things that, that are being evaluated by others. The uh, Dave is running from the DA's office is looking at the issue of uh, working with the university program out of Madison to look at cash versus signature bonds. Um, and what does that mean relative to incarceration rate or versus release into the community? I think that there are a number of things. We, we did, you know, I want to caution you that, that our comments relative to systemic racism only re relate to, the, to our work, which was narrow in scope. It didn't deal with the community as a whole um, and others. And I, 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 I can't speak to that issue because we didn't look at that issue. Um, we did look at we did look at the arrest records and other issue other arrests and there are a number of of, um, uh, of factors that went into it but we didn't find a targeting uh, we didn't find a, a preference we didn't find an, an orientation toward um, that would indicate that, that certain populations were treated differently uh, I think that what you would find is that you know some of the practices you know they look for um, headlights that are out, you know, it leads to a stop and, you know, other things. I think that, that probably has a low income uh, bias, um, you know, relative to the maintenance of a vehicle. So there are some of those underlying issues that we didn't get into and therefore the need to track things in, into the future. But we could, in, in, our, in our conversations in the listening session, in the survey results, and in the focus 
group results, we didn't have that systemic racism as an issue up here. Thank you. Uh, yes, Ms. Campbell. Thank you, John. I appreciate the presentation. Um, and I've had the opportunity to kind of look at some of the policies of the police department and also talk to Captain um, Bliven. Um, had some very great conversations. And um, so, again, thank you for the presentation. I'm also concerned with the comments of it not being any systemic racism um, here in Marathon County or with Wausau Police Department. Um, I know personally I've received data from the police department that showed that there were some disparities. Um, I know with um, police arrests as well as when, when they would pull someone over, like what area is traditionally occupied by groups of color, um, have more frequent stops. So I know there is some things that we can look at to make it better. Um, where my concern is, is if we say that there is no systemic racism, then that stops the conversation from us being able to evaluate um, that there is a problem and to do better by it. Is there a copy of the full report with all of the findings and the data like available to the public? This is the basically the report. There are a number of appendixes that will include all the presentations that we that we had oh, that will be coming out. So it's, it's not accessible right now for the public. Because I would love they're to still, have. I think they're still assembling the appendixes. Okay. So it would be nice to have that to be able to review it prior to the May 18th public meeting. And I and I would encourage you if you have concerns relative to our findings and recommendations, please bring those forward. You know, okay. we. We were reacting to the information that we had and right. what was presented. And um, again, it, it's still in a draft form. Um, and if you have strong concerns or compelling information, we can take a look at it. But ultimately, our our job was, I think, focusing on the recommendations. Mm -hmm. You know, in in where how will we move the community forward uh, relative to mental health, the homeless, the the case management, and and others. I think that's where the strength of the report is. Um, in terms of directing the community and future behavior. And that's really what we were charged with doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norfleet. Yeah, how you doing? Yeah, thank you for the uh, your work. But um, this is my problem, is that this returns to a how people feel opposed to statistical evidence. Uh, community engagement only is a, an effective tool if people are engaging. But if you've already created an environment where people don't want to engage, and you statistically can only get three people or four people of color to want to participate, you've already, you should already acknowledge you have a problem. And when we say 80% of people approve of the work police are doing in this city, well, you could go to any survey on this city, and the majority of white people are going to say they are doing just fine. So that's not a number that really creates a sense of this is digging into what people are perceiving a problem to be. For me, I'm more concerned that this is a clear support for some other agenda, mostly police, because if you're tasked to look into the, the ethnic inequities, that is what we should be talking about, ethnic inequities. If we're talking about mental health, well, that, that should be a different subject matter. I think in a lot of ways, for me, it's, it's kind of more disheartening because the goal isn't to find out that the police are bad, but it's not to make sure that the police look good either. The job is to find out what is the truth, and by that truth, what do we need to do as a community to, to better Make, make this relationship between police and people of color better. I don't even like calling black people people of color, but make that relationship better. And I think it's almost impossible to make it better when everybody has already agreed that they're doing a great job. 
and the mi minority of people who are, so they say, are not happy, well, those were the people who weren't happy in the first place. I mean, Marathon County is still segregated. You don't have a bunch of black people here. You don't have a bunch of, I mean, you got more Hmong here than black people, and they're not a large number of this community. So I'm just kind of concerned that are we using dynamics of just how many people you can get into a room and get them to express their feelings, or are you really juxtaposing this data opposed to why you can't even get people into the room? Because it's the same thing at City Hall. It's the same thing at Marathon County. It would be nice to say that you guys are just wonderful. They said the same thing at Marathon County. We don't have any systemic racism here. We got a black lady working here for us. That's what I heard. And I'm trying to understand that who, who is getting to decide this concept of systems of ethnic bias. So if we're trying to get to some relevant case of systems of ethnic bias, I think we have to be specifically talking about interactions with ethnicities, period. And I think we kind of put so many things under this umbrella that the whole point of it gets watered down. But go ahead. Well, we were, we were charged with investigating underlying social needs, including mental health problems, homelessness and trauma that bring people in contact with law enforcement. I think we've done well, that. But, but the I, problem but is, I think is we've that also, I started and uh, I was saying you We could just uh, let Mr. Oh, Robbins, we'll have a clear back and forth here if that's okay, Mr. Norfleet. But I, but I think you, if you look at our recommendations, I think we did flag the, the, the issues of multicultural, um, the need for multicultural education uh, and communication and engagement. We, we expanded, we were strong in the support of the, the, the context of interfacing, interacting with those through the neighbor to neighbor concept with the, with the feeling that we need that dialogue to better understand what those concerns are. Um, and um, finally, we, we wanna make sure that we're tracking the data uh, at, at all levels of, of government. So I think that there are a number of ways of addressing those concerns, but we can, we, we, we can speculate in, you know, we, we tried to reach out in a very difficult time with COVID. It, it was an extremely difficult time for public engagement. We, we, we tried to look at ways of how we can capture sentiments through the listening sessions, the surveys, and the focus groups. It's a snapshot in time. It doesn't mean it's 100% it's accurate, but it's the best that we could. Um, and you had seven uh, members of the um, of the task force that, that were pretty um, strong in their support of the recommendations going forward. Did you have an additional comment or question, Mr. Hartley? <laughs> well, I'm not really, you know, I, it, the actual police task force was not a real big deal for me because that's not the biggest issue for Marathon County, really, is the policing here. It got pushed to the front, as you said, because of what occurred with George Floyd. And when you say that, that is a specific occurrence. So I think it kind of leads people to believe that you're going to really be dealing with something specifically. And I think part of the problem becomes when that specificity becomes just more numerous than, than the actual item itself. I mean, because homelessness and transportation, that in itself is a whole ball of wax, which is totally separate from how police are going to necessarily interact with just a, a person of color. Totally different set of circumstances. So I just think that becomes more of a, you know, what are they really looking at here? And, you know, what are these reclamations? Are they going to be just fluffy, sentimental, anemic things just to make the community feel better? That's my concern. And that's what I'm, I'm concerned that that's the ultimate outcome. Is it just something to make people feel good? And I, I don't want people to feel good. I want people to live free. That, that's my point. But you go ahead. 
Thank you. Ms. Campbell, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, I just was kind of wanted to clarify next steps. Um, so you guys got the report together. There's a public meeting, and then what's next after that? Then we will be. We have a scheduled meeting on the 23rd of May to look at it. Then um, to develop that plan of action. Then it's turned over. You know, the the task force right now. No members of the task force are in the city council. Right. Okay. Um, and so it really is up. Uh, you, you know, I think Chris raises a good point. Is this window dressing or is this a plan of action? And I, I think the hope is that it will, you know, one of the reasons we identify the dependencies, who else is a player in the game, is to make sure that when we develop that plan of action that we try to articulate as well as we can what those roles might be so it's not lost. So then it will be presented to the city council to make that determination if it's a plan of action? We, we did present the, f the preliminary findings to the council last night, okay. uh, but we are charged we need to present that to the Police and Fire Commission and to the, um, to the council. Um, and quite honestly, you, you, one of the hats that I do wear is a member of the Marathon County Board of Supervisors, and, and uh, you know, I intend, I've already had discussions with uh, Chair Gibbs on the need to deal with expanding the mental health services. And, these are tough budgetary times, but we've had those discussions ar already. It really will be how will we take those recommendations um, and implement them. They will, they will require an investment of either time, which is a resource, or money. Um, and that will be up to um, the, the members of the City Council, uh, Alder um, Killian and, and, and Larson and others, to, to make sure that we, we prioritize those, those issues. But, uh, I think, again, I think the report re reflects that it isn't just the police department that impacts how we address those issues in the community, that there is an underlying mental health, social services, human service, transportation service needs that really are at the root of the problem. And if we, we don't address those needs, we'll keep that revolving door going and we're not making any progress and I think that's what the report tries to to capture do you know of a way that the Liberation and Freedom Committee could help with getting um, a plan of action or kind of help the task force um, partner with to get those things accomplished well the, the task force will will basically complete its its mission so it's gone okay. um, at, at the delivery of the report um, so it will take it will take advocates um, you know, throughout the community to, to make sure that the, the recommendations are, are advanced. So um, if you want to pick up all or some of the report, uh, I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Herr has a question. Thank you, John, for all you have done. I was there in person when we did those uh, in-person uh, sessions that uh, John Mayor. Uh, one of the things that greatly impacted me was that Methon County of the city of Warsaw has 11 major Hmong clan leaders. At least nine of those were present, were present at the meeting. Uh, like I, I do agree with you what you said. Uh, the one stubborn problem with Hmong people is they base their life and their situations on a clan system. They don't really want to get involved with the courts and the police officers. And I do agree that one of the things we need to change is that mindset as well. So thank you for the report. Uh, a lot of the Hmong clan leaders have recently started adjusting themselves and starting to understand that, hey, there are other powers in play other than just clan leaders. They don't have the final say. And I believe with this task force that what you guys have done and the results that you guys have presented, I believe we can greatly uh, disperse that with the Hmong community as well. Now, my next question is, when that report does come available, is it translated in other languages other than English? We haven't. We haven't. We, we did all of our surveys in both uh, Spanish and Hmong. We can look at doing that. That's a good suggestion. Uh, we had talked to you about trying to prepare a, a video uh, summarizing the findings. I, I think we can take a look at that as, as well. But that's a good suggestion. Right. Thank you. Great. Anything, any other additional questions from the committee? I, I just want to say uh, thank you very much for taking the time to come here, Mr. Robinson, and share this information and speak with the committee. And thank you. And again, I encourage you, if you have concerns, to come to the May 18th 
uh, hearing that will be in this room. Thank you very much. Well, we really have only one uh, additional uh, agenda item uh, today, and uh, it is discussion and possible action regarding an information request from the Liberation and Freedom Committee to the Wausau Public Health and Safety Committee and the Wausau Police Department regarding statements made concerning the unhoused in the first quarter 2022 Wausau PD operations report and associated uh, 41822 Wausau Public Health and Safety Committee meeting in order to form a potential future committee advisory opinion or recommendation. And what you'll see in the packet, which we've seen before because it's our founding resolution and this committee uh, was started back in 2019 when this uh, resolution was introduced. It was then called the Mayor's Welcoming and Inclusivity Committee at the time, but the purview and role of this committee uh, is defined fairly explicitly in that resolution and uh, it is essentially as you can see from that resolution the packet that we are the advisory body to the common council uh, on the uh, information included and components included in that resolution so among other things uh, socioeconomic status as a welcoming and inclusivity factor is included in the founding resolution and we're not only to identify barriers to equality with such a status, but the other statuses that were listed in our resolution. And that's not an elective. That is our role and responsibility uh, to satisfy uh, what is in our founding resolution. So uh, there were statements made as those referenced on the agenda. Uh, if hopefully you've had some time to uh, look at the request in the packet. Uh, but essentially the committee is asking for additional information from the parties uh, in, involved in that meeting. They were discussing uh, homelessness and there was a concern and it's described uh, in detail in the information request that uh, apparently providing uh, resources and services to the unhoused locally, uh, there was an assertion that there was a direct causal relationship between that and increased unhoused individuals from outside of the area. It was described that, uh, uh, let me just read the quote from the committee meeting, uh, that other areas are actually depositing their homeless population in Marathon County and in Wausau for us to address. Uh, it's not just only our homeless population, we are now inheriting other communities' homeless population just because of the outpouring of resources that we have in our area. So as you can see uh, in the requested information uh, from the committee, the request was for information and documentation upon which such statements were based uh, and founded upon and re requested information should include uh, which areas are quote depositing their homeless population in Marathon County and in Wausau, uh, the method or means through which quote their homeless population is being deposited and also the number of individuals from uh, quote their homeless population that are being deposited. It also requests the definition of depositing as it relates to, uh, to humans and people. So. Uh, yes, I, I think before the committee does make any advisory uh, assessment and recommendation on this topic, uh, it would probably uh, do us well to get as much information as possible to see uh, what data uh, and research are these statements uh, uh, being made. Uh, what are they based in? What are they founded upon? I, I'd like to see the quantitative data. And there were also uh, essentially uh, assessments uh, about certain types of uh, criminal activity or violations of, of certain uh, code or ordinances it, it related to uh, some police statements and the committee based on the draft uh, information request would be requesting 
the uh, police reports for those activities listed in that 45 day period listed. So there's a draft information request in the packet and that's for discussion and deliberation today. But also uh, if we do decide to take any action, we wanna make sure that's within the confines of uh, our committee and its mission. So I, will, I do have some questions for the city attorney uh, if we do come to that point, Mr. Norfleet. Yeah, and as I read it, I guess I'm really not sure who who uh, is making these statements. Who's the actual, or do we not want to say that? Oh, it's that's fine. It's a matter of public record, and there is the at, you know the source attribution, the material in the packet, and it was from the public health and safety committee and the public access video. It is included uh, for uh, review. Okay, so uh, basically we're going to kind of stand still as a group, which is probably best until we get all the, are we just requesting this data or do they have a certain amount of time to give us this information? This is, at this point, just a committee request for information, but I would have a follow-up question for the city attorney on that, and I think it's a very good uh, question, Mr. Norfleet. It literally makes it impossible to respond to what I heard or what I read because it just, yeah, I, I guess I would just rather follow the facts of how did they come to their conclusion of what they're uh, stating. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Thank you. Um, I think I missed the last meeting, so I'm unclear. So just so that I am on the same page, um, someone from the public safety meeting made these comments, and now we're requesting information for them to back up these statements that they made. And then if they provide facts, they may or may not, then what are we what are we doing with this? Good question. So let's look at our uh, the resolution from 2019, and this not only gets uh, to be confusing at times, but uh, it can be a prickly subject. Uh, I'm not going to uh, hold that back politically. As an advisory committee, I think we're reminded that we're an advisory committee probably uh, once a day, and uh, and we are. So we will fulfill our role. But in in order to do that. Uh, there are only certain things we can do, and I'll ask uh, the city uh, attorney about that. But we only, based on the resolution, it's, it's our role uh, based on socioeconomic status. Uh, we can request the information in order to provide an advisory opinion or recommendation based on the data we receive, and it is just that. So as an advisory body, we can advise. Uh, there's no, uh, the, the body we're advising, which would be the Common Council, providing that recommendation, they, they do not have to heed uh, our committee's opinion, uh, but we were created for a, a certain role, and so uh, this would be to fulfill that role, but I do think we should at least get all the information before even determining if, if we're going to provide such a recommendation. Mr. Grau. Yeah, I, I also think, um, I read through all that stuff that Gene sent, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I didn't realize we had a budget. Um, it said budget neutral, that's kind of surprising. But anyway, um, I think as a, this committee, um, part of our mission is to actually help to reduce barriers and promote active engagement of marginalized groups. Um, we're charged with the responsibility to not just advise, but to address words and actions that keep this from happening. Uh, this holds true for the unhoused. I think of all the groups I can think of in the city, they are the most vilified group. Um, particularly by uh, officials who prioritize things like fancy bridges and images of the city over the security of a home. Then they rationalize these actions with dehumanizing and condescending rhetoric. 
And I, I just want to acknowledge, um, I'm going to say, call you Mr. Douglas because I forgot your last name already. Because I, I can appreciate how difficult it must have been for you to come here and speak in public, understanding that the city, you feel very distrustful of what the city has done or not done for unhoused people, and what um, the police department has done with unhoused people. So I want to acknowledge that. Thank you, Mr. Gr Mr. Gr uh, and if you could please just address the comments oh. to the chair, please. Well, OK. You can, uh, you can say the same thing, but just as a matter of formality, okay. please uh, address them to the chair. All right, well, maybe that's something else we need to consider, too. If we want to engage with people, we should have a means by doing that when they come to the meeting. So maybe that could be a future thing we could talk about. Because I, you know, is engagement all we talk about? Um, so I think, though, that the target of these comments can really expand to poor people in general. And that's the majority of people here in Wausau. Over 51% of the people here in Wausau live at or below the Alice threshold of poverty. There are 550 names on a, a list for subsidized housing, which has doubled in less than two years. Wausau ranks as the worst city in the state for the disparity between rich and poor people. And, the, and there is really, in terms of trauma care for mental health, it's non-existent. So we, what we're seeing is most Wasonians live one emergency, one eviction, one medical bill away from financial ruin and being out on the street. To call for an increased police response to a policy failure, in my opinion, is ineffectual, cruel, and distorts what really the root causes of homelessness and poverty are, and that's the system, that's the policy, not individuals. So I personally feel that people that ascribe to comments like this, uh, that, are there, that they are immoral, narratives about poor people, they shouldn't be deciding public policy. They shouldn't be deciding and prioritizing where our money goes. Because if one is poor, it doesn't mean that one should be treated or spoken of poorly. And I think we have to send this message strongly to the council. That's why I support, as a first step, this letter of inquiry for them, to allow them to explain just what in the heck they are basing these terrible comments on. Thank you, Mr. Gow. Uh Alder Larson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. One thing I neglected to add earlier is, is that I have an email out to the mail, to the mayor, uh, the president of the city council, and to the city attorney's office. They all got the same email. Uh, I have concerns about uh, the person from the public health and safety um, committee who's making these comments. And then, Alder Larson, I just wanted to make sure we don't direct any comments oh. toward personalities. Okay, thank you. Be, yeah. I, just want, I just want to say that um, people of this uh, demeanor should not be allowed on the public health and safety committee because how are we to move forward as a committee when these people are allowed on it? Thank you. Thank you, and just uh, for clarification, we do need to stick within the kind of narrow scope of the agenda item, which is an information request about the statement, so let's just uh, keep that on, on track there. Any uh, comments, uh, potential modifications, edits, things to add, uh, uh, subtract from that draft? No. Ms. Oh. Campbell? And what, like, capacity was the statement made? Like, yeah. Yes, it was. Uh, here, let me pull up the exact uh, details. So the, they were made, and bear with me, uh, <clears throat> during the 4-18-22 uh, public health and safety meeting, and uh, they were in relation to uh, 
the Wausau PD operations report, I believe, that was agendized and uh, discussed at the meeting in which uh, various topics had been discussed and the unhoused were, were just one of those. So was it like funds or something supposed to be going somewhere or were they trying to decide something? It's my understanding no action was, was taken from that item. It was an update, that's my understanding. As to why we have so many unhoused people? It described, uh, quote, uh, inundation with uh, complaints and increased complaints downtown about the unhoused and it inventoried very specific uh, complaints. Mm. Okay, thank you. Mr. Norfleet. Okay, I guess my question is, uh, should we be the body dealing with this? I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess my concern is, is this, is this where this should come to, this type of action? Uh, because I, I'm kind of thinking, I, you know, our, our, kind of our atmosphere is more proactive in the resolving of the problem, but I mean, I guess we could take it on, but I'm, I'm wondering, is this something we should be trying to figure out for the city, or should the city not have their own mechanism for dealing with this type of behavior within their system, I guess? Sure. Great question, and if the city attorney, if, if you wouldn't mind, could... Uh step up. I will say that apparently based on the founding resolution of this committee, uh, it was indeed uh, bounced into our court, but I think I would ask the city attorney, uh, so as an advisory committee, you've seen the resolution that defined uh, this committee, uh, is it within our purview to request information on such a matter in order to use uh, in the future potentially for an advisory uh, opinion or recommendation? I think you can always request information. I mean, you're supposed to identify, you've been tasked as you've highlighted here to identify issues and barriers to equality and educate the public on all these various issues. So, and I think you've stayed within the agenda item in your discussion, but you've got a lot of committee members that are wanting to know the background and the context of these comments that haven't apparently watched the video. So you have it agendized for discussion and possible action. Are you looking for a motion well, from your committee to approve sending the draft request that you put in the packet to that committee? Or maybe you should share with them what your thoughts were when you put that on the agenda. Yes, in fact, uh, before sharing those thoughts, I wanted to dot I's and cross T's uh, uh, and informally. So uh, would such uh, a motion, uh, can we as an advisory body entertain that to approve uh, this draft information request to send on to the uh, two bodies that are listed? Sure, anyone can make a motion as long as the it's agendized for possible action. Any committee member can make a motion and a second to do anything, amend the draft, send it to the committee with an additional request or whatever whatever the committee decides they want to do. Thank you, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do I have a motion? Motion from Mr. Norfleet. Second from Mr. Her. And I, I will read it. I, I think that's part of the rules as well. Uh, but, uh, so let me uh, pull that up. Uh, it's quite long. So, uh, Mr. Norfleet, it, is the motion then uh, to, could you please uh, be a little more explicit about uh, what the motion is? Um, we're making a motion to request information from the, what, what day was that, 418, uh, 2022 public safety and health meeting regarding a specific set of uh, inquiries about how homeless people are getting here, being dropped off here, uh, and inundating our city with uh, an uh, overwhelming number of homeless people from other counties. I would assume we're, we're being tasked to ask about. Thank you, Attorney Jacobson. Uh, would it be best if we uh, mention the uh, the draft 
request in the motion? I don't feel it's really appropriate for me to direct you in a particular direction or tell you what you should do or what I think you should do. Um, that's really up to your committee members to include whatever they want in their motion. And if somebody wants to round it out, then somebody can move to amend his motion or second Mr. Norfleet's motion. Um, you could ask him for clarification. So from a procedural standpoint, it's really up to the person that offers the motion what they're suggesting the committee do. Thank okay, you. So yes, thank you. So I'm I'm basically gonna ask what she said at first. So how did you well, the question on clarification is if you were making a motion for the specific draft uh, information request to be sent on to those bodies. Or was... I thought we was making the motion to have specific sets of information sent to us from these particular groups of individuals who made this statement that we're referring to. That, that's correct. In your request, though, are you in the motion, were, were you wanting to, as you said, request this information with the draft request that's in the packet, or did you have something else in, in mind? With the draft request in the packet. OK, and uh, I, I think that's clear. Uh, is that rounded out? Uh, Procedurally uh, enough, uh, Attorney Jacobson. I think that's their motion. That's yeah. it. Okay. Is there a second for that? I second that motion. Second by Mr. Her. Then uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Well, that passes unanimously. Uh, thank you. And the next, uh, the last item. Uh, is item number seven, identification of future agenda items. And uh, we won't get into these in terms of discussion, but it's just identifying items. I will tell you, there's quite a few in the queue. Uh, so if there are any additional you, you, you feel you want to describe now, Ms. Campbell. I think what Bruce asked earlier was very important. Um, in my mind, we were going to have discussions with people on what it is that they need uh, and how we can help and be a support for, for marginalized people, but how can we do that in this capacity when we can't interact with the, with the community? So I think we need to have a, a discussion on what the expectations are, what the limits are in our roles, and how we can still get out to the community and, and talk to them. Um, we need to have that conversation. Thank you, and just so I understand, like at one point we had put an agenda item about an engagement event. Would you like it to be that specific or is it more the broad question that you're bringing up again of how we engage in general? Well, both. Okay. Okay, thank you. We'll put those on the queue. Mr. Norfleet. Uh, could we put in the queue, let's actually do something. <laughs> I mean, we, we've been here for a minute. Well, I would like to actually put something in a queue that's going to come for, to fruition as far as uh, some level of engagement that where we can bring some of these subject matters out. Uh, I don't necessarily need to change the form of communication in the city council room when we're having a meeting, but... Uh, we do need to make sure that, well, if this is the only time people are going to get a chance to really have our undivided attention, well, then we really do have to figure something out because then we don't, they can't communicate with us in any other capacity because then the chances of running us on the street is almost nil. So either we're going to, you know, create and get moving with being engaging opposed to, because this leaves us at a disadvantage when we can't really communicate back and forth with people in the audience, which I, I do understand. And, and do sorry understand. to interrupt too, and I just want to make sure I'm getting the item because we don't want to discuss it for, just due to not having some of these things agendized, but would it be manners of engagement? Uh, is there a different uh, way you'd, you'd uh, describe that item? 
Yes, yes, a, a matter of engagement. I, I, I would think that uh, with all these current issues of ethnicity, impoverishment, and homelessness, I think uh, our due diligence on this end of what we're here to do is to start facilitating activity. It don't have to be perfect activity, but we need to be picking each other's brains, but we actually need to be getting our hands dirty and doing something for our citizens instead of redirecting all of the to-do list to somebody else within government. Thank you. Ms. Kopitke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, when you reference the queue, I'm just going to reference something that I've put on there before and just see if we overlap. Um, in terms of meeting up with people, advertising, possibly um, making a calendar list on the agenda of, and I've created one on my own, of events that are coming up in the next 12 weeks of summer coming up and setting up, uh, discuss whether we want to be present at those events, communicate that, how we would want to communicate that to the public so that the public can access us in a more informal setting, but also would we need to have a quorum and all of those things that would take place. Thank you, great one, I'll put that down. Uh, anything additional? Then uh, the last item would be adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? Uh, Ms. Kofi, a second from Ms. Campbell. Then all in favor, aye. aye. Thank you and thank you for the public for coming.